I guess what we're going to cover is, you know, what is it we actually need to scale and why? Like, what do we mean by scalability? Uh, the bottlenecks to scalability today, I'm picking some core bottlenecks that we can go over that are fairly simple to grasp. And then finally, the future roadmap that Ethereum is sort of considering. I know the whole modular approach I'm sure you've heard of already. What do we actually need to scale? So this is just a basic recap of, you know, what is a blockchain? A block is just an ordered list of transactions. A block is produced every 12 seconds and is appended to something called the blockchain, you know, given the name as a chain of blocks. And it represents the canonical history of the entire network. Now, Alice, you know, Alice is an inspector, so she has a cute little hat. And her job is to make sure that every new block that is produced is valid. And so what she'll do is she'll get a copy of the blockchain, she'll replay and execute every transaction, and eventually she'll compute a copy of Ethereum's database. Okay, so the one thing I want to highlight is we have the blockchain, which is the canonical history of the network and every single transaction that has ever occurred, and we have the database, which is your current account balance, smart, con con uh, smart contract bytecode, you know, the actual, you know, the program state as well, and they're two very different things, the blockchain's history, the database is up to date on my current balance. It's very important to have that distinction. And of course, the blockchain computes the database. So anyone here who gets a copy of the database or a copy of the blockchain can compute the same copy of the database as everyone else. So it's widely replicated across the world. And I like to call the blockchain a cryptographic audit trail because it allows us to audit the database in real time. You know, there's, you know let's say your bank, you can't audit your bank, can you? But you can audit the blockchain, it's an audit trail. Now, all this, the inspector could be any of us. You know, who's actually running a node here? Is anyone running a node? One guy over there, there you go, we've got some inspectors. That's great, you know, a small sample size, but still great. So the peer-to-peer -peer network, I mean, it changes from time to time, but it's normally around like 10,000 computers that are online, fully synchronized with the network, and they're auditing, you know, blocks in real time. Now, the peer-to-peer -peer network is responsible for propagating blocks and transactions. Its only goal is to gossip. If you have a transaction, it goes via the peer-to-peer -peer network and it spreads out to everyone. So a single transaction will reach you know, 10,000 computers, 100,000 computers, and that all has to happen within a few seconds. The same for blocks. On the peer-to-peer -peer network as well are the block, pro block proposers. In Ethereum, we call them the validators in the proof-of-stake chain. In Bitcoin, they're the miners. The block proposers are also on the peer-to-peer -peer network they're listening out for users' transactions and, of course, new blocks. Now, the only thing block uh, the block proposers provide is a transaction ordering service. They have absolutely nothing to do with what it means for a transaction to be valid. They just take user transactions, stick them in a block, order them, and then you know, send that out to the world. So as an example, a user sends their transaction, flows across the network, and every block proposer will hear about this in about two to three seconds. And then a block proposer will produce a block based on the transactions they hear, and every single peer in the network will get this block, validate it, and then update their copy of the database. And that's basically what's happening under the hood. A block is really like a botch update, you know, for a database. You're just doing it every 12 seconds, and you're updating everyone across the world their database. And so what we end up with is this public and global database. Conceptually, it's like a bulletin board. Like everyone here can see the exact same image. Under the hood, there's thousands of copies of this database everywhere. It's widely replicated, and that's what helps secure the network. Because if anyone can get a copy of it, then we can also check that it's correct. So where does scalability come in? You know, why, why do we care about scalability? So there's two real people, there's two you know, parties we care about. One are the block proposers. It's really important that block proposers can get the most recent block right away so they can you know, take the block, check it's correct, and then extend the blockchain. The block proposers want to converge, let me get back to the blockchain. The block proposers want to converge on a single blockchain. So when a new block is produced, they want to take it, and then extend it, you know, block one, block two, block three, block four. 
So it's really important they can get the blocks very quickly. At the same time, we have the peer-to-peer -peer network, we have Alice the auditor and some people in this room. And your job is to hold the block proposers accountable. You want to validate every transaction, and if they try to break the rules, you know, they try to include an invalid transaction, then the peer-to-peer -peer network will reject it. It gets rejected, they don't make any money, they wasted their time, and of course, you know, block proposers will then just not extend it. So there's two parties we care about, block proposers and the verifiers. And what's important is that, you know, what do we mean for scalability? What we really care about are the resources. You know, what compute is required, what bandwidth is required, and what storage is required. And we have to consider these resources with the goal of decentralization in mind. You know, what are the minimum requirements for someone to run a node? For someone to validate blocks, or even for someone to become a block pr proposer. Do we have any stakers here, by the way? Any Eve 2 stakers? There we go over there. We got a couple of Eve stakers, you know. We got to make sure that the resources are good enough so you can run your staker at home. Hopefully, you're running it at home anyway. I don't know how you're doing it. But we know we care about compute, bandwidth, and storage. Now, if there's one takeaway here, I hope this is the biggest takeaway you take. Scalability cares about resources and the delicate balance between verifiers and proposers. So proposers can make blocks and verifiers can check it in real time. It has absolutely nothing to do with transactions per second. That's more like a byproduct. You know, you can have one transaction that explodes the database and then none of, no one here could be a verifier. So if you ever hear a blockchain project, which of course you will, you're like, we can do 10,000 TPS, then you can just call their bullshit. Because, sorry, the cares, because it's all about resources and that's the most important thing we have to consider and how we measure scalability. So the re just to recap the basics there, you know, we have block proposers, transaction ordering service, they propose blocks to the network. We have the peer-to-peer -peer network that has block proposers and verifiers. Anyone here can be a verifier and your job is to hold the block, pro block proposers accountable and make sure that the consensus rules and the network rules are enforced in real time. And finally, scalability has nothing to do with TPS. It's about resources and how, you know, what's the likelihood that someone can participate in the network. So let's have an overview on some of these scalability bottlenecks. Oh, yeah, what? Exactly, yeah. It's, well, we'll get to the sort of the balance there, but that's a good point. Like, what, what is the meaning of resources? And for the goal of decentralization, we need to pick the right you know, configuration that maximizes the population. So if we say, you know, we want 90% of people in this room to run a verifier. What are the requirements? That's what we have to have on the network. Any other questions, by the way? Please throw your hands up. You know, there's no dumb question. So let's have an overview of some of the scalability challenges that we face today. And we're going to do this again through storage, computation, and bandwidth. And you'll see computation and bandwidth sort of join together when we talk about the fork rate. So let's jump into storage, okay? So the storage requirements for a node is, you know, how big is the database? You know, there's a database of everyone's account balance. How big is that? There's something called the mempool. And it's more like a cache. So you're on the peer-to-peer -peer network, you're running a node, and you hear a new pending transaction. What you'll do is keep a copy of this and pass it on to your peer. If you hear the same transaction again, you'll just reject it. So it's really to prevent a denial of service attack on the peer-to-peer -peer network. So people can't spam it with the same transaction over and over again. But again, that's something you will have to consider when you run a node. And of course, the blockchain itself. How big is the blockchain? And even how long does it take to synchronize it? You know, how long does it take us to compute a copy of the database? So before I begin, has anyone ever heard of an archival node or a full node or a prune node? Okay, awesome. And raise your hand if you think they're really confusing terms. Oh, look at this. Oh, there's one guy. Thank you, the good guy over there, the honest guy. They're pretty confused. And all the Bitcoin maxis have no idea. You know, uh, they're always uh, misinterpreting the phrase. So let's talk about them. What's a full node? A full node is a piece of software that will take the entire blockchain, validate it from scratch up to the beginning, and then compute a copy of the database. Importantly, they keep a whole copy of the blockchain locally. So they don't discard blocks, they keep all the blocks. The reason they do that is if you join the peer-to-peer -peer network, 
well, you need a copy of the blockchain. So a full node will supply new peers on the network with a copy of the blockchain. So they keep it all around. And uh, most important, what's actually quirky about Ethereum is that, so if you look at the blocks, you know, block seven, eight, nine, ten, nodes typically keep around copies of the database. I think it's like 128 blocks worth. I forget the exact number. And the reason for that is to handle reorgs. So has anyone ever heard of a block reorg before? Okay, we're going to jump into the block reorgs very soon. That's part of the fork rate. But the idea is that if your transaction got confirmed on block 7, and now we're at block 10, you have some guarantee that it's probably going to get finalized. But an alternative block fork, maybe from block 5, could emerge that removes your transaction. But if that's the case, well, you need to have this database so you can quickly jump back and then deal with the new fork. And so we have to keep around, you know, put 100 copies of the same database just to deal with reorgs. But all the other databases can be deleted. You don't care about you know, very historical databases, just the most recent copies. An archival node is very different. An, an archival node is something that Etherscan would run or a block explorer. An archival node is where you want to quickly look up historical data. So maybe you have a request, what was my balance a block to? That could have been a year ago. There's no reason to run that on the peer-to-peer -peer network because the, you know, the probability of a one-year reorg is very small. In fact, impossible in proof-of-stake Ethereum. But an archival node will run this. And that's why when you hear quotes, you know, an archival node is like two terabytes in storage and Ethereum isn't scalable, well, that's because they run an archival node and you, know, you don't need all these databases. You just need 100 of the most recent databases. Then a prune node is where a prune node will discard the historical blocks. A prune node will just keep around the most recent blocks and the most recent copy of the databases. They prune as much as they can, and they have minimal resources. And they still validate everything. You, know, you still go from the start to the end. You validate it all, but you just keep around the most recent data. So my question to you guys is, you know, uh, it's my next slide. If you're going to run a node, like a block proposer or a verifier, which one would you run? Let's do a raise of hands. Would you run a full node? For either a verifier or block proposer. Yeah. yeah, okay, raise your hand, guys, if you think you want to run it. Yep, that's fine. That's a good answer. What about an archival node? Would you run an archival node for the network? No one's, I mean, you, I mean, you can, but there's no need. You know, it's a bit a waste of resources. And what about a prune node? Yep, exactly. And that's probably what most people run today. You know, most people don't want to keep around the entire blockchain. They just discard most of it. And as we're going to see, that's quite a lot of gigabytes. Yes, yeah, so an, an event, that's a great question. So basically, when you execute a, so in Solidity, in a smart contract, you can define an event. So let's say it's the vote function. If I cast my vote, it will emit an event that will tell the world and notify the world that Patrick has cast a vote. The way you get an event is when you execute a transaction, it produces a transaction receipt. And in the receipt is the, is the event. Importantly, most, I don't even think archival nodes, receipts aren't typically stored. They're normally discarded right away. But yeah, so you don't really store them, but you can still get the events in real time because you, you're validating blocks in real time. Any other questions, by the way? Yep. I think, I mean, I, I will touch on this. That's a great question. So just to summarize, Ethereum now has two layers. It has the beacon layer that deals with proof of stake, and you have the execution layer, which deals with obviously the execution of smart contracts. For now, I'm assuming they're the same thing. You know, if you're joining the beacon, you know, for the beacon chain, again, you just care about the last finalized block. After it finalized, you, and that's about like 15 minutes, you could technically just delete the rest of it. You need to keep around recent data. But for now, we'll just assume they're both the same thing. But we will hopefully touch on that soon. Yeah, so the real difference is that in a full node, you keep around the entire blockchain. And the reason you do that is to serve it the peers on the network. A prune node deletes most of the blockchain. They just keep around, I say, in this case, four blocks. And that's the deal with forks and reorgs. It's called reorg safety. I think there's default settings. Um, I think there's a default setting, but really, you know, the more you store, the better you can handle reorgs. So one issue we had was, I previously worked on a transaction relayer 
where you'd send transactions and try to guarantee the delivery. So we wrote our own blockchain machine, the deal of reorgs. And we would keep around three to 400 blocks. And you know, obviously copies of the database. But if you run this in Robston, Robston was a very adversarial network. And you'd wake up one day and there's a 20,000 block reorg. And the real error was just tip over because it just can't do with 20,000 block reorgs. So it really comes down to what network are you running and you know, uh, what, so another example is Ethereum Classic. Ethereum Classic has had 10,000 block reorgs in the past, which would also make a lot of nodes just collapse over because they they're not expecting that huge reorg. Oh, for reorgs, um, I think, okay, so let me, let me get to the reorg section first. We'll have a picture of it, but yeah, reorgs are less likely to happen in proof of stake. You know, because part of it was part of the puzzle for proof of work. But uh, I will touch on that because uh, there is still, prop, you know, a good chance on, on proof of stake. Yep, exactly. So on proof of stake is about, optimistically, it should be about 15 minutes. Worst case scenario could be like three weeks. Um, well, maybe we'll chat about that afterwards. It's a great topic. Okay, cool. Any other questions or are we all satisfied? Cool. I guess your goal is to make sure I don't finish my slides as well. Very likely to happen. Okay, so let's look at what a node would store. So on Bitcoin, this was maybe four months ago when I made this, uh, the database was roughly about five gigabyte. But if it was an archival node version, it was about 35 gigabyte. On Ethereum, the, you know, a, normal pruned, no, a normal database was about 700 gigabyte. So the database is quite big on Ethereum, you know, according to the stuff that I have here. An archival node was 10 terabytes. And that's normally the number you hear thrown around Twitter by all the Bitcoin maxis. But as you know, that's for block explorers. And Aragon got this down to about 1.9 terabytes. Uh, I actually forget how, but, but we'll, we'll figure it out. And then what about the, the blockchain itself? I guess it's look here. The blockchain, so for Bitcoin, you can see that the blockchain's about 422 gigabytes, which is huge, by the way. But on a print node, they keep around seven gigabytes worth of blocks. They discard most of it. On Ethereum, next slide, the blockchain is about 200 gigabytes, you know, so it's actually smaller than Bitcoin, which is surprising actually given, you know, there's blocks every 12 seconds. But that's generally because blocks are smaller on Ethereum than they are on Bitcoin, because we worry more about gas than we do byte size. You know, Bitcoin's all about, you know, one megabyte, two megabyte blocks, and it's really about the size of the, the transactions. But here, you know, it's about 200 gigabytes for the blockchain. And overall, including what's in memory and what's in disk, you're probably going to store around 560 gigabytes, give or take, it's around that. Uh, like Klein got me this, by the way. He's really, really thankful for him getting me that, that picture. And of course, flood protection. You know, how do we deal with, you know, denial of service attacks on the network? On Ethereum, it's about, I, I had a rough estimate, about 100 megabytes you might store in the worst case. So the memory pool has nothing to do with scalability, really, so far. We're not really hitting any storage problems for dealing with uh, pending transactions on the network. So that's storage. You know, we covered, you know, blockchain, the database, and the mempool, and the different types of software that you could run. So what about computation? And so there's this really great blog post I'm going to run through by James Lop. He runs this every year. How long does it take to synchronize a node? And he has this pretty beefy machine, has one terabyte storage, 32 gigabyte. Let's see, how, let's see how well it works. So on Bitcoin, back in 2011, but November, it took about 400 minutes to synchronize the entire blockchain. That's pretty damn fast. That's, I don't even know how long that is, like five, six hours, and you're fully caught up on every transaction that's ever occurred on Bitcoin. Yep, that's a great question. I'm not, I'm not too sure if this includes bandwidth. I don't know if they already have a copy of the blockchain or if the request's not in real time, because that latency will cause an issue. Well, I, let's just assume it's for computation for now and we're not worried about latency, because I'm not actually too sure. I don't think he defines it in the, in the blog. But anyway, it took about you know, 500 minutes or 400 minutes for Bitcoin. What about Ethereum? So his issue was that uh, Go Ethereum ran out of memory when it was synchronized and it stopped but after five days. But that's because he has one, gig, you know, one terabyte storage and he could have more stories to deal with synchronizing. Uh, but he would estimate it would take about 10 days. But the important bit here is, what's the bottleneck? Why has it taken 10 days to synchronize Ethereum? And you would think it's execution, but actually it's input and output. It's just reading and writing to the database. Here, according to the, the stats that he had, you would read 15 terabytes from disk, 
and 12 terabytes back to disk for the first five days of, trans of you know, the blocks. And there's another five days to do, by the way, so that's probably 20, 30 terabytes worth of reading and writing. And why is this? You know, why are we doing like 15 terabytes of reading from disk for a blockchain that's about 500 gigabytes? Or the database. So the reason is that, oh, actually, just before I get into the reason, have I deleted the reason? Oh, I haven't. Okay. It's over there. Obviously, I've messed up my slides. The reason is that in Ethereum, in the block header, there's something called the state root. And this is good for the snapshots. You know, you want to download a copy of the database. You want to make sure this database was correct for this block. And so in the block header, you have a hash of the entire database. You know, you get the entire database, you build your Merkle tree, then you have a hash that represents the entire database. But if you're hashing the database for every single block, that's a lot of reading and writing from the database. And that's why you have those stats. Um, it's also, you know, it's very expensive. So Aragon stopped doing that. So their reading and writing the disk is still about a terabyte after 10 days. But actually, no, they, what the fast did they synchronize? They synchronized in two days. So just removing that one part of the validation, you see of eight days worth of time to synchronize. The question is, do you need to do this? Should you have to hash the entire database and store it in a block header? So in Aragon, when you get to the most recent block, you'll download the database from the peer and peer to network, and you'll check if it's correct. And if it's not correct, then you'll start rolling back until you find the mistake. So it's not as an essential check, but it's useful if you want to download snapshots from the network off the actual database itself. But the surprising takeaway here is that execution isn't really the bottleneck. It is expensive. Execution is expensive, but just reading and writing from the database is the current bottleneck for Ethereum. The disk can write. I think it's the first point that you made. It's just the, the, the latency from reading and writing from disk. That's why it doesn't work on his you know, hard drives. Works on SSDs. That's also a great point. Very good technical point. <laughs> um, yeah. They should, I mean, so uh, there is work on that called an access list. So in your transaction, if you define an access list, I think I touched upon it later, you can define what storage slots in the database you're accessing. And so if you have two transactions that don't access the same part of the database, you could run that in parallel. But right now, access lists aren't heavily used, but they, they should be because they help with parallel execution. Anyway, just a final joke. I mean, I, I don't mind Solana. Actually. I'm not a hater on Solana, but uh, he just made a joke that you know some projects just give up on the fact that people can synchronize the blockchain. Uh, I think actually this is the internet computer. You have to get special hardware from their own suppliers to run a node on their network. Very permissionless, isn't it? Um, but anyway, that's synchronizing. It's a, it's a fun topic to talk about. So what about the fork rate? So let's assume all block, all block proposers are honestly following the protocol. They get a block, they extend it, and they propose a new block. No malicious behavior whatsoever by the block proposers. So the fork rate is the following. So let's say you have block one and block two. Then a magical wild fork appears. You can have block 3A and block 3B proposed by two different block proposers. The question is, which one do you extend? Eventually, you know, they'll get block four, block five, and everyone will converge on the longest chain or the heaviest chain. Block 3B becomes a stale block. You know, the content is ignored, and it eventually ends up as an uncle block. So if you ever hear the word uncle block, it's a fork that didn't make it into the canonical chain, but it did exist. And in a way, it's just wasted resources. You know, you have these two competing blocks, You've wasted some resources because this never actually gets used. You really want to maximize a single canonical fork with no, with no forks. Okay, any questions on this part before I continue? Because this is quite important. Fairly straightforward? Awesome. So the inability, so why do we, why do we consider the, 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 the fork rate? So one is about this, you know, how reliable is the network? You know, if you get your transaction confirmed in a block, but there's a 16% chance that it gets dropped and reconfirmed later. Well, that sucks from a user experience perspective. You know, if I only have to wait two or three confirmations, that's way better than waiting 20 confirmations. And the fork rate is really about how reliable is a confirmation in a block. At the same time, there's a bandwidth on a compute overhead. If I send everyone here a block, I've used your bandwidth. You then validate the block. I wasted your compute. 
But in the end, the block never gets in the blockchain. So I've just wasted your resource for a block that wasn't actually useful. And so you really want to minimize that fork rate. And there's two aspects that we have to consider is one, you know, what's the length of time between blocks? Is it 12 seconds? Is it 10 minutes? And how fast does a block reach another block proposer? Okay, and also, of course, what's the frequency? So this is sort of the big block versus the small block. We're back in the 2015 world with the block size wars. You know, this is pre... Actually, I guess Ethereum was born around this time. So if you have a one megabyte block every 10 minutes, if you imagine this being the peer-to-peer -peer network and reaching all the peers in the network, then a one megabyte block should fly across. You know, everyone gets this within a second. Not much issue. If you have a one gigabyte block, you know, every 30 seconds, well, maybe, you know, one gigabyte takes a long time to get across the network. And then you may have a competing block at the same time. Then you have another competing block, and you just have lots of forks. And then, you know, you've wasted the time because there's more, there's three competitive blocks. And of course, this is a waste of bandwidth and compute. And so these are two extremes. We have a two megabyte block every, oh yeah, I'm right now, you know, if you have a, you know, a block that's greater than two megabytes, but less than one minute, you increase the fork rate. Smaller blocks, longer interval, smaller fork rate. So is there a good way to get, you know, a good feel in the numbers here? So there was a study back in 2016 for Bitcoin, and I would love it to be repeated for Ethereum because it's very useful for proof of stake, is, oh, and just one point is, uh, on Bitcoin, we only consider megabytes, the size of the block. On Ethereum, we consider gas because gas takes into account bandwidth storage and compute. You know, 30 million gas is the maximum size of a block, and it tries to take into account all the resources that are required. And actually, there's a Zcash article there because right now Zcash is being spammed, it's costing $10 a day, and they're growing the database by like a gigabyte per day or something. You know, it's very cheap to, you know, attack the network. So on Ethereum, you know, blocks are around 120 kilobytes, there are 30 million gas, and they occur every 12 seconds roughly, even proof of stake on proof of work. That's, that was for the proof of work chain. On Bitcoins, you know, one to two megabyte every 10 minutes. So on Ethereum and proof-of-work Ethereum, the fork rate was around 5 to 6% at any time. So that means, you know, 5% of all blocks were wasted resources. And that's just because of the nature of proof-of-work. Where today with proof-of-stake, it's less than 1%. And one thing to highlight is that on proof-of-stake Ethereum, the block proposer has to send the block within 4 seconds, then the validators in that committee will vote on that block. If it takes longer for a block, as it take, if it takes longer than four seconds for a, a block proposer to get their block across the room, you'll end up with a fork because the committee will vote on the parent block and not the current block. And so you can see right now, there's very little forks. So clearly, you know, there's a good block size for the proof of stake chain. If the fork rate goes up, then we know stakers are no longer keeping up with the network. And in Bitcoin, I got this picture from February 2022. They happen every one to two months because it's small blocks every 10 minutes. Very rare to have a fork on Bitcoin. So what's the ideal block size and interval? Again, from 2016 for Bitcoin. And they were trying to work out, you know, given the current peer-to-peer -peer network, like this room, if I want to make sure 90% of people in this room can get blocks in real time, what's the ideal block size? And so... So who, actually, what do you guys think that ideal block will quit? I'm just about to get on that. That is a big part of it. Yep, Ch the Chinese firewall specifically. Um, so I'll leave that for a second. Any other questions before we continue? Awesome. Okay, cool. So just, look like, just throw some numbers out there. Back in 2016, if we want to keep 90% of peers on the network. What do you think the ideal block size would have been without increasing the fork rate? Does any wild megabyte number out there? 1.5 megabyte, there we go. Any other megabytes? Two megabytes, one more guess, one more guess. Oh, Bitcoin, this is 2016 Bitcoin. 20 megabytes, oh wow, so we found the Bitcoin maxis and the Bitcoin Unlimited, <laughs> if you know your history. No, that's great though, that's a great, great guess. So, um, so the ideal block, have I deleted the slide? Of course I have. So the ideal block size was actually around four megabyte, from what I remember, it was about 4.2 megabyte or something. Uh, they keep 90% of peers on the network. And just for that table, 
So what we're saying there is that that table is really saying, you know, how long, like how fast did the top 10% of nodes get the recent block? And then how long does it take for 90% 90 90 of nodes to also get the same block? So in the first example, for, or for the second one, for a one megabyte block, 10% of nodes will get this within 1.5 seconds. And then 90% of nodes will get this in 2.4 minutes. So that's a 2.4 minute difference between the top nodes or the faster nodes and the well-connected nodes and the slowest on the network. So what impact does this have? So that's my little China logo. So as I mentioned, back in 2016, 2017, uh, some, there were some forks on the network because the 70% like of miners were in China. 30% were in the rest of the world, which implies the Chinese miners got the blocks faster. They get the blocks faster, well, then they can you know, start working on it before the rest of the world. So they may get like a 30 second or a minute head start on just solving the proof of work. And so there was a bias towards Chinese miners. And what actually happened was that you had this private relay network between all the miners. So they just bypass the peer-to-peer -peer network altogether because of this issue. But basically, you know, uh, block proposers will fall behind if they're, you know, the 90% nodes in the network. On, on, on stake, for proof of stake, if it takes longer for four seconds for you to get the new block and you vote for the wrong block, or even 12 seconds, you may incur some penalties. You know, so you won't get slashed, and it's not like you won't lose all your money, but you may not get like little rewards and your, you know, your yield will go down a bit. So your yield's directly impacted by how well you're connected to the other peers. And obviously as a verifier, well, you know, if, uh, if there's blocks every 12 seconds, but I'm getting the block after two minutes, well, I, I just fall behind eventually and I just can't keep up with the network. I can't get up to the copy of the database. I just fall behind and I'm not useful anymore. So typically when we think about the size of blocks, we normally assume that the block proposers are very powerful. You know, they should be able to quickly get blocks, execute them and send them out within two to three seconds. We assume verifiers are weak. So verifiers, maybe it takes them, you know, six or seven seconds to get the block, but that's okay because 12 seconds is the deadline. So we normally assume, you know, different specs for different parties. And I do have it there. There you go. Four megabytes was what would the report recommended on Bitcoin. And you still have 90% of nodes participate on the network. It's probably much higher now, but that's like six years ago. Why is this all important? You know, why do we care about this aspect of scalability? And it really comes down to, you know, what does it mean to be decentralized? And everyone has different takes on what it means to be decentralized. My take is really, you know, what percentage of the world's population can validate and protect the database in real time? So regardless if you're in, I don't know, Libya, Australia, China, the US, you should have the right to run the software, get a copy of the database, validate the blocks in real time, or participate as a proof of stake, you know, staker validator. It's the same for both because that's what it means to be decentralized. It's a bit like Captain Planet. You know, we put our rings together and we protect the network. So there are the bottlenecks. You know, I've just gone over some bottlenecks that impact the network. There's obviously a lot more, but there's always good not to overwhelm people. So let's summarize this. Storage. You know, the storage bottleneck is really how big is the database? Uh, how big is the blockchain? And realistically, who can, you know, can my hardware deal with that, you know, the size of that database? As we saw with his computer, James Lopp's computer, he couldn't synchronize go Ethereum because he ran out of space. So clearly his computer could not participate on the peer-to-peer -peer network. So you have to consider storage and you know, how big this database gets. Two is compute. How long does it take me to get a copy of the database and be convinced it is indeed you know, the, the one true database that we all have? And right now, or well, proof of work at least, you're supposed to objectively validate from the beginning to the very end. And then bandwidth. You know, how long does it take for blocks to get across the network? And can we fall behind because we just can't get the blocks in time? You know, what's the latency issues around that? And the most important bit is, and this is why I don't like transaction throughput as a metric, you know, if you just blow up the TPS, you know, the, the tip of the chain can become unstable because there's too many forks. And then it's also difficult for us to keep up. So I think for, I remember hearing a stat for Polygon, so the proof of stake Polygon, an archival node was growing two megabytes every second. 
And that's pretty damn big, isn't it? Like 2 megabytes every second, it gets to 15 terabytes. And then AWS can no longer handle that in a, in a you know, straightforward manner. So anyway, that's actually why, again, the whole point of scalability is that fine balance between block proposers and verifiers and you know, how big that database gets. So how can we scale while still adhering to what it means to be decentralized? And before I get into this, was there any questions for the previous section? I remember there's no stupid question. So the uncle blocks, um, so you have the, so the entire block is the block header and the block content. The block content are the transactions. That gets thrown away. All we keep around is the block header and it'll be included in a future block. So if block, one's the block, if block one was the uncle block, then maybe the header gets included in block five. So we're still aware that it exists. Yeah, that'll be an uncle block. So an uncle block has no impact on the database. We just acknowledge it to say that it existed. And then you reward the block proposer for doing their job. Oh, definitely. I, I hope I alluded upon, I think I've got that in my slide, but what he's saying is that, you know, one of the ways we're going to solve these issues are zero knowledge proofs. So zero knowledge proof is really useful. It allows me to do a lot of the hard work to say, you know, let's just say I want to prove a transaction's valid. I do all the hard work, then I send you the result of the transaction on a small proof that will convince you that it was correct. So that way you don't have to natively replay the transactions yourself. I give you the result plus a proof and your convince is fine. But that proving part is very expensive. I think it takes uh, one or two seconds per transaction on a CPU. And you know, if you're having to do that for uh, when you're proposing a block, you know, I create a block, I make a proof for every transaction, that's pretty slow. So uh, that's still very much a work in progress. So that'll be more for the rule ups. So the rule ups, you would assume there's a very powerful executor who can you know, run GPUs, paralyze them, and do the proofs in real time. For, for proof of stake, Ethereum is probably a little while off because proving is still very expensive. I mean, it's not too, it's much cheaper than it was four years ago anyway. I think a Zcash transaction, because that uses zero knowledge proofs. Back in 2015, I think it was 60 seconds on a CPU to prove your Zcash transaction. And now it's like a second or something. I don't know. It's probably fast. I think it's like, so he's also saying about the byte size. So I think that's more of a problem for Stark. So Starks will grow based on how much you're proving. Where a Snark is constant size. Is, they're fairly, I forget the byte size, but they're fairly small. But Star, that's a Starkware issue. Yeah, they're, I think it proves to cost like 5 million gas and Ethereum to verify just for the proof because they're very big. But anyway, um, any other questions, guys, before I continue? Awesome. Cool. Okay. So what, how are we going to solve these scalability issues? So just a reminder, when we consider scalability for the block pr proposer, we want to reduce the fork rate. We want to make sure no one is wasting their resources when they propose a block. And on the verifier side, we want to maximize the population of who can validate blocks in real time. So reduce the resource requirements to run a node. That's basically what we're trying to achieve. Now, over the years, since 2015 up to about 2020 and today, there's been lots of crazy wizardry tricks from basic engineering principles on the, you know, the make it easier to run a node. So one is, you know, you can compress data before you send it across the wire. So on Bitcoin, we call that a compact block. You know, I, I give you a block, but actually I don't give you the transactions. I give you the block, you know, like the, the transaction hush. And then you've already got the transaction in your mempool, so you can quickly reconstruct the block yourself. So you reduce the data you're sending across the wire. Very simple engineering. You have private relay networks. So in Bitcoin, all the miners had a private network that only they could connect to and propagate blocks. So you bypass the peer-to-peer -peer network completely. You know, is that you know, ideal for a censorship-resistant currency? It's a different question. You, know, you could do parallel execution. We had a question down there before. Maybe if you access lists, you know, I know two transactions don't conflict. Execute them in parallel. We speed up our ability to validate transactions in real time. And there's also like, you know, set reconciliation, that's also compact blocks. But the issue is that in all of these engineering approaches, we're making it easier to do the job, but they still have to do it. So now a lot of the scalability research is thinking, do they need to do it? Could we take that responsibility away from the peer-to-peer -peer network and, you know, give it to a external provider who could do it in their behalf? So the peer-to-peer -peer network does the absolute minimum. So what's the goal? So it should look like this. To protect decentralization, 
we work out what is the absolute minimum the peer-to-peer -peer network has to do and what can we offload to services, providers, businesses. I always make the joke Infura could do this. You know, what could you pass off to Infura to protect the peer-to-peer -peer network? And so who's heard of this idea like the monolithic blockchain and the, I guess, modular blockchain, but this says microservices. Who's heard of that idea before, the monolithic blockchain? Okay, but less people than I expected, actually, that's great. So I stole this actually from a normal Web2 company because it isn't a new idea. You know, you build this big monolithic code base, it's difficult to maintain, difficult to upgrade, and what you really want to do is take out the little components and maintain them individually, and hopefully delete them as well. So that's what Ethereum has been struggling with. For the past six years, we had this monolithic blockchain where it's trying to do everything at once. And now what we're trying to do is define each of the microservices or the modular components, and then of course, solve each problem individually. So let's go through how we're doing this. So first we have compute. Compute was one of the resources that we cared about. You know, how long does it take to execute a block? What if you could uh, have a dedicated execution layer? So there's an execution layer that's doing most of the work, and Ethereum doesn't really care about that. All Ethereum cares about is the result of that execution. If Ethereum doesn't have to do the execution, well, it's way easier to run a node if you don't have to execute anything. You know, you pass it off to someone else. The other one was bandwidth. So right now, we have to propagate all the transactions and blocks across the network. You know, what if you could have a dedicated data availability layer where you don't even care about the transaction content? It's like a blob of data. As long as there's a blob of data, you know, you get the blob of data, then you can throw it away eventually. You know, could we have a dedicated layer just for data? And Ethereum doesn't necessarily care about that either. And finally, storage. What if a node, you know, didn't have to have a database? Could you run a node and just delete the entire database and not care about it? But the database is stored somewhere else. So if you want to transact, you talk to the provider, you get the database content, and then you send it off to the peer-to-peer -peer network. You know, could we build a settlement layer, in a sense? where all it does is minimal computation, maybe stores account balances, but otherwise it, doesn't, it minimizes what it has to store because you push that problem off somewhere else. That's the idea behind the modular blockchain. And it looks like a simple renaming. You know, I could be a marketing person being like, well, we're going to solve compute with an execution layer. You know, I just rename it. But actually, if you just find like, you know, if you make this dedicated layer in action, then you can think, how do I solve this problem? So we're just real renaming the resource in a way, but in a way where it makes more sense on how to solve it. So what this actually leads to is the roll-up centric or the roll-up centric roadmap for Ethereum. Has anyone heard of this? The roll-up centric roadmap. Okay, great. About, about five or six people. So <laughs> that's good though, because in 2016 Ethereum, they thought they would solve the world of execution sharding. We all realized that was like a, a moonshot that was too hard to do. And then rollups started to emerge, and rollups look like sharding in a way. And so we've all pivoted towards this rollup world where we do all the execution and rollups. And what we're actually what's really solving the day are bridges. You know, uh, this is how we've scaled cryptocurrencies for the past 10 years. So raise your hand if you've ever used like Coinbase, Binance, or Bitstamp or whatever. There you go. Don't worry, I'm not the SEC, I'm not here to dox you. You know, uh, but, you know, realistically speaking, in a way, cryptocurrency exchanges are like sharding. You know, you deposit your funds in the Coinbase, you go in the Coinbase execution layer, you transact as much as you want there, and then you bring the funds back. And you're using Ethereum as a settlement layer, you know, to get your funds on and off Coinbase. But otherwise, Coinbase is where the execution happens. The issue is that, oh, I've already got the question, but the issue is that if you move all your computation to Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance, well, it sucks a bit, doesn't it? It's fully custodial. You, know, you have to deal with our customer support if you get locked out. It's a private database. We have no idea of the, uh, you know, of the assets cover the liabilities. We have no proof of reserves. We have to blindly trust this execution layer. We can't audit it in any way. And we can do better than this. And that's the goal of this roll-up centric roadmap. The goal is to build a bridge that connects to another blockchain system this off-chain system that you can check in real time. And the bridge will hold your assets, 
You can mint it on this other system, transact there as much as you want, and then bring your funds back to Ethereum. You, know, you burn it on, the, on this chain and bring it back to Ethereum. So really bridging is at the heart of how we scale Ethereum. If we can build good bridges and move the computation elsewhere, we solve a big, pro a big part of the scalability problem. And Ethereum then becomes a settlement layer that does minimal computation for the bridging and of course recording everyone's account balances. So really it's how it's gonna deal with bridging in the future. Okay, so just to summarize, what he means is that when you bridge the, you put the funds in the bridge, you go to his other network, there's gas fees here as well, and then there's also bridging it back that causes funds, or you know, causes right. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, Ethereum should be the most expensive chain, so that'll always be expensive. So ideally, most users, oh sorry, I'll just finish this one. Most users should not have to interact with Ethereum. They just live in these other layers and quickly transfer their funds. And because they're the execution layer, we can assume that they have, like, you know, like StarkNet, for example, they can aggregate lots of transactions and, you know, aggregate the cost for everyone. So there's still a cost, but hopefully it'll be a lot less than Ethereum. <laughs> so they go, go ahead. Yes, that's a great point. So what he's saying is that when you bridge your asset to another layer, you're taking on the risk of the bridge. And we've all seen the Binance bridge, the Nomad bridge, the Ronan bridge, the Wormhole bridge, another bridge, there's obviously a collective more. They all keep getting hacked. And there's clearly a smart contract risk of using a bridge. And then depending on how you've designed your bridge, you may also have risk on the off-chain system as well. So that's why the roll-ups, you know, what they're trying to build, I'll just jump to that now. Oh, actually, let me finish this bit. So the roll-ups are trying to build a bridge where you don't have to trust the off-chain system at all. So really, if the bridge is, you know, bug-free, then you should not have to trust the off-chain system at all. So that's the, the long-term goal. But right now, a lot of the bridges are a bit, there's a lot of trust on a lot of the bridges. But anyway, so let's go to the settlement layer, Ethereum is a set of funds, and the execution layer are on these off-chain systems that offer a seamless user experience. And the point here is that the off-chain database and the execution layer records the liabilities, and the bridge records the assets. And the bridge is here just to make sure the assets cover the liabilities and protects the user on the off-chain system. And how does the bridge protect the assets? You know, this is sort of the roll-up talk where you talk about a validating bridge and how the bridge is designed to protect the funds. For now, we can just talk about, you know, how do we guarantee all the updates to the database are valid? You know, the bridge should get an update from the off-chain system. Then the bridge has to be convinced that this update is valid and correct. And if it's correct, then it will accept that that's the new state of the database. You know, the bridge will always check, is every update to this off-chain system valid? Yes, it is. The funds are safe. And the other one is, there's sort of the fraud proves versus the optimistic roll-ups. The next one is the data availability problem. And this is really what I want to talk about. So... If you're on an off-chain system, okay, and all my funds are locked on, I don't know, Arbitrum. What that assumes is that there's one honest party in this room who can come online, get a copy of the database, and guarantee that all our transactions are eventually executed, and we can withdraw our funds from the system, if that system's malicious. And this comes down to data. And there's three things to consider, you know. Why does the data need to be publicly available? What data needs to be publicly available and how do we guarantee it is publicly available? So for these bridges, what you're assuming is that there's one honest party who can get the data, recompute the off-chain database, execute the transactions, propose an update to the bridge and let you get your funds out of the bridge. Now this is very different to Ethereum. As we've just said for about you know, the past 40 minutes, there's this trade-off between block proposers and verifiers and the resource constraints. Here we just have to assume there's one honest party. There's one honest party out there with enough resources to get a copy of the database and execute the transactions. And anyone in this room, ideally, could be that honest party. So that does allow you to go beyond the restrictions of the layer one. You could have this big beefy machine. This I don't want to say supercomputer, but you have a beefy machine on this network that can you know, reduce the fees for everyone. Because now the main fee on a roll-up is not execution, the main fee is the data that you post to Ethereum. That's the biggest cost now for using rollups. Um, the type of data that you would post would be, you know, the transaction history. So you would send the bridge all the transactions, or maybe it's just an update to the database. You know, what is the state diff between the two databases? Um, how do we make this available? You know, just to skip over this a bit, 
There's a challenge proof test for plasma. It's sort of failed. And it trusts like Arbitrum Nitro or StarkNet. Um, there are data availability committee. They have a committee that guarantees the data is available and not one honest party can get the database. Or a real app where you take all the data and you post it to Ethereum. And that's the next part. So now we have the settlement layer, which is Ethereum. We have the execution layer that's doing all the hard work. The guarantee one honest party can get that database, all the data is being posted to Ethereum. And so Ethereum also becomes this data availability layer. The guarantee that one honest party can get the database for the off-chain system. So the long-term scalability goal for Ethereum is to make this data as cheap as possible. If you can make data or bandwidth cheap, then you could have real apps that are humongous in dealing with you know crazy amount of transactions. This is the dank sharding. This is EIP four eight four four, and this is sort of what they're going towards in the next few releases of Ethereum. Their goal is to make data cheap, so real apps are viable. And so, if this is the case, then we push all the hard work off to the execution layer. And the protect decentralization, we just care about data and we just care about settlement. Okay, that is what we mean by protecting decentralization. Can you get the data across the network as fast as possible? And now there's also you know, different networks emerging because now that we've separated our concerns, maybe you have a dedicated data availability layer like Celestia, Polygon Oval, or Ethereum itself with dank sharding. I have a, a minimum of Ethereum X, I don't know. We have the settlement layer here, which is Ethereum because they're doing the roll-ups. Then all these different execution layers are emerging. They're all solving different parts of that puzzle of how we scale Ethereum. And so just to summarize, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll put that back up. I see someone taking a photo. Cheers. <laughs> just to summarize, because I know that's a lot to take in, by the way. As I mentioned, we start off easy, and then we get very, very hard. Um, just to summarize, you know, there's, there's uh, we allocate a resource of purpose, you know, data, settlement, execution. Now we're solving each of these puzzles individually. Scalability is really by bridging. Bridging is how we'll scale Ethereum because we'll move the assets, but we'll move the assets to another network and transact there. Bridges are give or take very insecure, but we're working towards building a, a secure version of bridges. And of course, data availability is really the big bottleneck now for how we're struggling with Ethereum. And just to finish up, because I've got one minute left, I just wanted to add this last part. Oh, go ahead. So the bridge should be able to independently check everything itself. So when you give me an update, if I'm the bridge, you give me the update, and I should be able to check this is a valid update. So either you give me a zero knowledge proof, so there's a mathematical guarantee, or I ran a fraud proof, where I get the update, and there's like a one week window for anyone to convince me that is incorrect. So the bridge has to be convinced. Cool. Awesome. So maybe I'll just finish here. Um, I think this is a great talk. We nearly, we, I didn't finish the slides, but that's awesome because we had a lot of great content. So I'll leave it here and I'll let the next speaker come up because I think he's hanging down there somewhere. So thank you guys. GG. Awesome. <laughs>